Again, my name is Leanne Foster, and I am a provider outreach and education specialist here at WPS Government Health Administrators. And again, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on provider enrollment documentation requirements. I did just moments ago start recording this material, so I just want to make you aware of that. The material presented today is accurate as of today. As you know, Medicare changes often, so please make sure that you continue to review official CMS communications, including the CMS and WPS GHA website for the most current up-to-date CMS rules and regulations. Any questions that I answer today are going to be answered based off of today's CMS regulations. Uh, again, if something changes, the answer to a question may change, but we're dealing with documentation today, so um, just something to be aware of. So, as I said, this session is being recorded today. It will be made available to you on our YouTube channel as soon as possible after today's session. This is going to allow you to view it again or share with anyone that was not able to attend but might find this useful. Um, because of that, photographing, screenshotting, and recording this education for profit making purposes is strictly prohibited by CMS. As I indicated, we are recording this so you will have this available to you without having to do any of that yourself. And again, just a reminder, if there are more questions than time allows, I will be sending out a follow-up communication indicating what qu those questions and answers that we didn't get to. So that brings me to our objectives and agenda for today. So when processing applications for provider enrollment, we do frequently see the need for development on missing documentation. Depending on the application, it can sometimes be challenging to know what you need to send in for the provider. It depends largely on the application, the scenario, the provider type. So you could include everything you think we will need, but this is gonna get a little frustrating because you may be are inc not including what we need, but giving us everything else and if you're submitting electronically, it's not as big a deal, but if you're submitting on paper, well, that's gonna be paper and postage costs that we wanna help you avoid. So our object objectives for today include helping you understand when documentation is needed. And this includes helping you to determine what documentation is needed. Because as I said, this can vary by application scenario and provider type. I'm also going to talk about common documents including what we look for on these so that you can make sure that the document you have, it may be the document we're asking for, but maybe it's missing something. We wanna make sure it's the correct document and contains all that information, so we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about how you would submit documentation. Now on paper, that's gonna be just included with the application, but specifically I wanna focus on how documentation would be submitted in the provider enrollment chain and ownership system in PECOS. We often get questions on that and I wanna help take care of those today. So let's start by talking about why Medicare requests documentation to begin with. As you all probably know, CMS does require certain forms of documentation based on the application scenario and provider type, and you're gonna hear that a lot from me today. When documentation is required, it generally means that there's a requirement for eligibility that we cannot verify through any other means. There's a CMS requirement. We need to know something about the provider that that on that application, whether that's an individual, whether that's an organization, whether that's for a Part B provider or that's for a Part A provider. It's going to vary. So our documentation, like I said, is verification of eligibility. So this will include things like education. Uh, a good example would be our latest edition of mental health uh, counselors and marriage and family therapists. There are certain education requirements for them and depending on the state, we may or may not be able to verify the level of education simply by getting a copy of that license. So we may ask for a copy of the degree. Usually when we need an educational degree, it's because we need a certain level. Perhaps we need a master's level or a doctorate level. And these will be outlined. I'll show you where you can find that information. But that's one of the reasons we ask for that information. We may ask for a copy of state licensure information. Again, especially if it is not verifiable on another public source. 
Most of our states allow us to verify that information. Some do not. Some we're looking for a particular type of license that we may not be able to verify through a publicly available source. We'll also ask for state or national certifications. One thing I do want to point out, typically we're looking for these certifications on non-physicians um, specialties such as physician assistants or nurse practitioners. Again, information that's not publicly available to us otherwise may require a copy of that certification. I do want to point out here though the board certifications for physicians typically not needed. Uh, we, it's not required for enrollment, their licensure is required. So national board certifications for uh, medical doctors or doctors of osteopath typically not required. Actually I could be fairly comfortable in saying never required. Um, personally processing applications, I've never had to actually require that information. Again, certifications typically are for your non-physician specialties. CMS may also ask us to verify information regarding a provider's business setup, specifically their business license, making sure that they have gone through the local governing bodies to set up their business, also referred to as an occupancy license. Are they operating in a, a business in a site that they are legally able to do that? Now this is something that we certainly cannot verify, and we'll talk about this more, uh, cannot verify it through a publicly, uh, another public source. And so that is something that you may find yourself asked for. Um, they ask us for this, for us to verify payment information, so banking information. We are going to need to verify, obviously not publicly available, but verify account information, routing number information, to make sure that we are depositing funds into the proper account. And not only is this something that would be provided on the application, but it needs to be backed up with documentation. The other thing that we will ask for is if there are any adverse legal actions that have been taken against an entity or a provider. In, generally in the last 10 years, we are going to need that reported and we are going to need documentation of that legal action. And that can include the action taken, resolutions, uh, court documents, documents from the state. And again, we'll talk about that in a little more, more detail. The common theme here is, is that we're requesting documentation for items that we can't otherwise verify. So the next question becomes, when do you need to submit it? So it varies, but in general, document could be needed for all applications, but we're gonna kind of distill that down and make that a little bit easier to understand. That's pretty broad, right? It is possible for you to need to submit documentation for individuals if you're submitting an 855-I or an 855-O. And an 855-O is one where we get a lot of questions because an 855-O is for providers that are ordering or referring for uh, Medicare services, they're not actually billing Medicare. So why do we need to document anything? Just because they're not billing Medicare doesn't mean that we don't need to verify their qualifications. They are going to be referring for services that will be billed to Medicare. Providers that are ordering referring will get a record built in our PACO system uh, so that their MPI can be part of claims for services for which they have referred. So with an 855-0, we still need to verify things like education and licensure. You will also see the need for verification for organizations and suppliers. So the 855-B, so your medical clinics and your 855-As. So we're talking business licenses, accreditations, uh, tax documents, account information. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. You may also need to submit that documentation for most application scenarios. Now, I can simplify this for you. For initial enrollments, most commonly, you've got to think of this as a scenario where the provider is likely an unknown entity to the Medicare program or at least the MAC. It could be the provider's first time enrolling in Medicare. Maybe they're changing jurisdictional states, but in the jurisdictional state that they're enrolling in, they are an unknown quantity or entity. So we need to verify information. So initial enrollments are always going to require some type of documentation. Um, for individuals, that's gonna be things like licenses and um, educational requirements. For businesses, that's gonna be tax documents, account information. So think of the entity 
that you are submitting the application for. And if they're an initial, we're going to need the things we're talking about as we go through the presentation today. Now, revalidations. This is a scenario where a provider is established with Medicare and every five years they're asked to revalidate the information we currently have on file for them. Typically, we've already verified all of the information. So for documentation purposes, you generally typically only need to provide documentation for information that has changed. So if there's account information that's changed, for example, or the provider didn't need a business license initially, now they have one, that can happen. We'll talk about that more. Um, we would need that documentation. However, if you have a provider who is revalidating, it's an individual, nothing has changed, their education level hasn't changed, their license hasn't changed. Typically at that point, we can verify that information and you wouldn't necessarily need to include a lot of documentation for a revalidation if no information has changed and you previously provided the documentation. The same can be said for change applications. It's in the name, right? It's a change application. So what's changed? If we're changing something like a correspondence address, you're not going to need documentation. If we're changing something like a practice location address, we might need a business license depending on that setup. If you're changing a name, we might need a copy of a license. We might need to be able to verify that name change. One other thing, sorry. Um, the other thing that I do wanna point out is case by case basis. There are some scenarios where we may have to verify something that's a little bit outside of standard documentation. And what I mean by that is maybe you have an address that's brand new, it's in the process of being built and we can't verify that address. We might need some documentation to help us verify that brand new address that's maybe not even in the postal system just yet. So there are some instances where we may ask for case by case documentation. Doesn't necessarily mean anything's incorrect in the application. It means we are being asked to verify something. Again, we can't through other means. So we do have resources available for you to help you know what documentation for what application type, or at least what documentation is possible. So I'm going to go there on our WPSGHA website, underneath our Topic Center for Provider Enrollment, and this is available whether you're looking under our Part B or Part A side of the website. Under Guides and Resources for Provider Enrollment, if you scroll down, you're going to see an accordion folder that is titled Documentation. If you open that up, you're going to see a couple of things. And the first one that I want to point out is Provider Enrollment Documentation. And a link for that is being placed into the chat, so you'll have that. But what you have here is fairly all-encompassing. Obviously, there are always going to be some case-by-case -case scenarios, as I mentioned. But you're going to have a chart that is, in the first column, going to tell you the provider type. And then in the next column, it's going to list the documentation. Now, if you have an initial enrollment, you're going to need all of this documentation that's listed, okay? And it'll even go down to specific provider specialties, okay? Because it does vary based off of specialties. As I mentioned, some non-physicians, we need a national cert. It just depends on the provider scenario. But this is a really helpful tool if you're not sure what your provider needs in terms of documentation. So I encourage you to maybe bookmark this uh, and have this handy. This is a helpful tool. The other place that you can locate the information is going to be on the CMS website. And I'm going to go back to the beginning of the navigation on this. So on, from the CMS website, I also encourage people to go out to the Program Integrity Manual or Chapter 10. In that, you will see Section 10.2 that talks about requirements for providers. And it's usually by specialty, or it is by specialty. And it talks about the same information that was on the WPS GHA website. So you have a couple of options. And to get to that Program Integrity Manual, I typically under, go under Manuals and Forms under the top resources. Just a quicker way of navigating there. 
From here, you will see the link for internet only manuals. And the program integrity manual is right here. It is 100 8. And then we're looking at chapter 10, which is all things provider enrollment. Not only the requirements from you, the provider community of what you need to provide to us, but it can also offer some insight in how we are processing those applications. Our guidelines are very transparent. They are out here um, so that you'll know what we're looking for. So I do recommend that you look at this. And in section 10.2, what you're going to see is the section titled Provider and Supplier Types. So there's a section for the 855A, the 855B, the 855I, and the O. And within that, as you can see here with the A, you're going to see specialties. Underneath those specialties, if you go to those sections, it talks about the definition of those specialties and the documentation that's needed to substantiate enrollment for that specialty. So again, I encourage you to take a look out here um, I think you'll find that this is useful as well. And as I mentioned, that link was in the chat. It is also on this page, that uh, provider enrollment documentation, that is a link to that article on our JHA website. So you have that, that resource, that link available to you in a couple of places. And I do want to point out that page is also fully, fully searchable. So it'll be helpful to you. So we've talked about why and when you need to provide that documentation, what we're, why we're asking for it, the type that you may need. But I'd like to show you some examples of the documentation. Um, as we go through, I will be talking about individuals, suppliers, and organizations, and I'll call that out as, as I go through. And I want to point out these are common examples. It's not all encompassing. Your documents that you're providing might look different visually, but they may be, they w could be the same type of documentation. Again, we're talking about national certifications, we're talking about multiple state licensure boards, and every certification body, accreditation body, a licensure board, they're probably going to have visually their own formatting for what their documents look like. We're not looking necessarily for all of them to be the same, but I'm going to give you some key markers of things to look at to know, yep, this will work for me. So we'll start with licensure. So licensure is typically something that we need for initial applications. Once the initial enrollment is in, revalidations and changes, unless something has changed about the licensure, we're not going to need another copy. An example where we might would be an ambulance service provider. If you have an ambulance service provider that was initially enrolled as basic life support and has now gone on to be licensed as advanced life support, we would actually need that as part of the change so that we can change the level of code that they're eligible to bill Medicare for. That is probably the most common where that licensure changes. Uh, this is not going to encompass, say, um, a group that now has a lab, a freestanding lab. That is going to be something that's going to require a separate initial enrollment because it's a different type of business. So that is not exactly a change. So what we're looking for here is proof of eligibility. So for individuals and facilities, all facilities. So from a Part B perspective, individuals, if you're looking at the uh, Example farthest to the left, that's going to be what an individual license could look like. It's going to have the name of the regulatory body. Uh, this has all been redacted. So you'd see the provider's name, you'd see the provider's license information, and an effective and possibly an expiration date. Sometimes they don't have the expiration date and that is okay. That's typically something we can verify in a publicly available source. But sometimes what we're looking for, and I'm showing you an example of one that is specific to marriage and family therapists, it will call out the type of license on that copy. And those are some of the things that we're looking for. Uh, the other two license, if you're looking at the one on the top, that is an example of a nursing home license. They're typically licensed by their state and we'll need a copy of that. Looking for the same things, name of the facility instead of the individual in that case. Um, you may have sponsorship information. We're going to see their license or also referred to as a certificate number and effective 
dates. Um, those effective dates are really huge because coming into enrollment, that effective date can directly impact an entity or individual's provider and um, provider transaction access number, PTAN, or on the on the uh, Part A side, it'll be their Medicare number, also referred to as a CCN. They will not be allowed to practice prior to their licensure date for what should be obvious reasons. So we really do look at that. Um, the other license that you're seeing here is a copy of a pharmacy license. So if you have someone who is enrolling as a pharmacy or a roster pillar, again, same information. When is it valid from to what type of license? I mentioned ambulance before, it would say advanced or basic life support in a couple of different ways. Um, and that's really what we're looking at from here. It does need to be from the state where they will be practicing. We do look for that. So if you have a provider that's moving, say, from Indiana to Michigan, uh, maybe they're, you know, crossing the border and they have offices in both states, they're going to be need to be licensed in both states. The next thing we're going to look at is going to be educational verification. Again, here you'll see a couple of examples, and these are going to vary. We have seen everything from nice copies that you're seeing here where they've taken the, the diploma, where they've gotten maybe an electronic copy, maybe they've had to scan it in. We have seen pictures. Uh, I can re recall actually seeing a picture where I could actually see the frame. I could read the diploma. There wasn't a glare. That was fine. Uh, we don't ever want the original, and that's the thing with all the documentation, don't send us the originals. Um, you need to have that. We just need a copy, and they don't need to be notarized copies. Um, obviously, they have to be a copy of the original. If there's a notary on it, we're going to see that, but we don't necessarily need the embossed notarized copy because one of the ways of submitting these is going to be electronic, so certainly we're not going to have the original copy there. It'll be digital. But here it'll you'll see it has the name of the university, the, um, again, redacted, but has the name of the person that it was awarded to, and then it'll have, typically it'll have the date and it'll be signed from the university. One of the things we're really looking for, though, is that name and level of degree. Here you're looking at some master's degrees. The one in the back is a clinical uh, master's of clinical social work. The one in the forefront is a master's of physician assistant studies. And one that we have to request often is for certain states, sometimes we need to ask for a master's of nursing for our nurse practitioner, non-physicians, because we do have states that will issue that license with less than a master's and CMS requirement is a master's. And that's one, that's one thing you may see when you're submitting. Sometimes you're asked for something, sometimes you're not. And a lot of it hinges on what that licensure that we just talked about requires to receive that. As a MAC, uh, WPS and other MACs do this as well. They reach out to the licensure bodies for the states which they administer to determine if the state licensure board has the same requirements for licensure that we do for Medicare eligibility. And if that's the case, you will find there are times where you're not being asked for documentation that maybe you would be elsewhere, it has a lot to do with what's required for that licensure. And we as Max do that to reduce that provider burden so that you don't necessarily always have to provide everything. So knowing your state's uh, requirements can help you kind of narrow down some of that documentation as well, but know that we are doing that as for you as well. The next is examples of certifications. What you're seeing here are the, this is going to be for individuals specifically, um, as the diplomas would have been as well. We will ask for certifications. Typically, the certifications we see most often are with physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Uh, with physician assistants, there is a publicly available site that we will leverage to verify certification information on the application. However, if it's a really new cert certification, we might not be able to access it yet because their publicly available site might not have that information. So we can take either a certificate, which looks like a lot like a diploma, or the letter um, that they get. This particular NCCPA certificate, uh, again, redacted, but this is for one that was issued fairly recently. It has, again, the name, it has a cert certificate number, and 
that issue date. And we worry really heavily about the issue date. We have ways to monitor expiration dates. It's the effective dates because that impacts the effective date of the PTAN. Along with licensure, we will not issue a PTAN with an effective date prior to a certification date. So if those two don't jive, we will go, we're limited one by normal effective date issuance rules. Uh, handed down by CMS, but one of them is, is an effective date cannot go before the date the provider met all eligibility requirements, which includes licensure and certification. So we are taking all of that into consideration when issuing those PTANs. On the right, what you're looking at is a nurse practitioner certificate and same thing, recurring theme. We need the name, we need the number, we need the dates. Unfortunately, this is one there are some, time, some instances where states do not require this for a nurse practitioner license. And they're called different things with different states. I'm just using that as a, as a global way of uh, describing that license. And if it's not required, we have to get a copy of it. Unfortunately, this is not something that we as a MAC have access to a publicly available verification source. So this is one that we do often find we need to ask for. Um, so if you're enrolling nurse practitioners, it's probably a good idea to provide this certificate, especially if you know that one was not required in order to get the license. Um, and it has to be required. It isn't, we aren't looking for if they submitted it in addition to state requirements, the state itself has to require it. And if we can't get that documented in writing from the state, we'll need to ask for that certificate. The next piece of documentation I'd like to talk about is the Drug Enforcement Agency certification. So this is referred to yeah, with the MAX with the DEA certification. Um, it is used for prescribing certain drugs. It is not a requirement for enrollment in the Medicare program. Um, I want to repeat, for provider enrollment to get a PTAN, the DEA certificate is not a requirement. We will, however, put it on file if it is provided. Now, there's a bit of a challenge with this getting it verified through a public source, and I'll spare you the details of that challenge, but I can tell you that we're not always able to verify these. We will if we can and we'll try to do so off of what's provided on the application. But there are going to be times, if it's provided on the application, if we cannot verify it, we are bound by CMS guidelines to then request a copy of that certification. Because if we cannot verify it on a publicly available source, we have to get a copy. If it's not reported on the application, then we can move forward. But if it's reported and we can't verify it, we have to develop to verify it. So it could potentially hold up your application. We have reached out to CMS and unfortunately, they're not budging on that. So if it's provided, provide us a copy of that certification. If there's nothing wrong with providing it, it's good information to have on file, but it is not required at this time for anyone enrolling in the Medicare program. Next, we're going to take a look at adverse legal actions. So documentation is always if an adverse legal action is being reported. This is typically section three of all of the applications. And for the 855As and the 855B application, sections five and six. So for your owners and your managing employee, for each one of them, we are asking for their information and, hey, does this individual, does this entity have any adverse legal actions that they need to report? If, they're, if they do not, they're answering no to that question. Documentation isn't needed. If they answer yes, and again, we're looking for actions taken generally in the last 10 years. Um, we're looking for felonies, licensure surrender to perhaps avoid further actions against them, convictions, okay? We're looking for that information. If one is being reported, we need a couple of things. In the section, we need the action taken, the dates and the entity the action was taken by, and then we're going to need documentation. And this is typically court documents. So it could be literally the docket 
from the hearing. It could be licensure board documents because sometimes it could be a suspension or a license revocation. Not necessarily going to have the same documents as something that actually went to court. Um, and if the action was taken and been rescinded, it's been expunged, you know, the provider's provider or entity's been reinstated, we would need copies of that as well. And I want to be clear, just because an adverse legal action is reported in Section 3 does not necessarily preclude an entity or a provider from being enrolled or being part of an entity's enrollment if they're the owner or managing employee. But CMS needs to be aware of it and a decision determination has to be made and we need that documentation so the appropriate determination can be made. So the examples that I've gone through are have been a little bit of individuals and organizations or a little bit of organizations mostly individuals but again things like the uh, licensure and the adverse legal actions that could impact an organization but before I really dig into organization specific types of documentation I just want to check in with Mary and see if there's any questions Thanks, Leanne. We did receive one question, and this was concerning documentation requirements. Uh, specifically, are there different rules for federally qualified health centers as far as documentation requirements? Good question. And we're going to talk about the documentation requirements for organizations coming up, but typically, no. Um, if there's an accreditation, we'd need a copy of that. But as far as tax documentation, account verification, adverse legal actions, any licensures that you have, those documentation that documentation requirements are going to be the same. And again, I would recommend going out to our WPS website and the Chapter 10 link that we shared, because it will document and lay out the specific requirements for FQHCs. Excellent question. And that's it for now. Excellent, Mary. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, we're moving on to more organizational specific, corporate specific. I shouldn't say organizational because there are individuals that will fall in this category. And that is evident with this first one. So, this first example, I am talking about IRS documentation. Now, this would impact obviously an organization, FQHC, a hospital on the Part A side. Uh, critical access hospital, ambulance supplier, it could be a lab, a roster biller, anybody who's going to be leveraging a federal IRS identification number versus a social security. That includes, again, um, sole owners typically. If there is a sole owner and they have a corporation and they're leveraging that corporate tax ID, we need to verify that. And what you're looking at here are a couple of examples. The one that's slightly to the top, furthest to the left. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, typically it has the form number on it. These are the most common. That top one is a 147C. This is kind of the all-encompassing, hey, you got an IRS letter or IRS number. Here's your letter. Save this, use this as needed. Um, what you're also going to see here is going to be um, a letter 4168C. Again, just another flavor of a similar letter. And that bottom one is a CP575, and that is one that we see a lot. That CP575, um, again, is a notification letter. And these letters have to be from the federal IRS. They have to be computer generated. They have to include the tax number and they have to include the provider's name. If they don't, we can't accept them. We can't take anything handwritten. Um, a W-9 is one that we get asked about a lot. Um, they're typic those are typically handwritten forms. We can't accept that. What we're doing is we're verifying that the legal business name in our system is matching the IRS and the National Plan and Provider Enumeration System, also known as MPES. It's that legal name. What happens, well, it's going to happen shortly, 
the IRS kind of spot checks our records to make sure that our legal names for tax IDs match theirs. And if they don't, we'll have to research those and get corrections requested from the provider. Maybe something's changed with them that didn't change with us. We'll try and get that change reported into us. Here's, here's the thing, if it doesn't match, it is possible the IRS could ask us to implement something referred to as a backup withholding because they'll see it as a legal name that is not getting a 1099 reporting taxes, that kind of thing. So we request this to avoid all of that. And I can tell you, we do avoid most of it. Our system's also connected to um, the federal IRS. We can't see into that system, but it will tell us if something's not right. And if something's not right, we're gonna have a hard, we're not gonna be able to enroll the provider. So we're trying to avoid hiccups along the way. One thing I do wanna show you is we do have a resource available on our website that talks about the tax documents and I am going to go back to the base and just show you that navigation again. It's underneath our topic center, not tools, pardon me, provider enrollment, again under that documentation accordion and there is a document specific to IRS form and it calls out CP 575 because that really is one of the most common forms that we get and it's talk about talking about everything that I've mentioned here today it's also adding where on the forms you know if you're reporting a number here um, the other thing that it has here is going to be the contact information for the IRS. If you need a copy, and that's down here. If you need a copy or if something needs to be corrected on it, you have an avenue of how to get a hold of the IRS to get that taken care of. And sometimes that has to happen. And this tax document, if it's needed for an enrollment, it is something that will hold up an enrollment application. Initials um, are typically where you see it. If a provider is changing a tax ID, typically we can't change that. So that's going to kind of convert into an initial because we're not able to change a tax ID on an enrollment record. Um, and that's for tax purposes, how the 1099s go out at the end of the year so, or the beginning of the year. So helpful resource here for you. The next item is the business license. I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, and this is that occupancy license. Has the entity or provider uh, done their due diligence with their city, county, state, you know, other local government to make sure that they are legally operating a business in their space? Not all cities, counties, or states require an occupancy license for a medical practice, and we do not have a mechanism in place with which to monitor that. So this is really being put on, on the provider. And if a business license is needed to operate your license or operate your business, we need a copy of it. It can be in the form of an example here you're seeing for the city of Lapeer. They all look a little different. Again, we don't govern that. We don't oversee that. But it's telling us, yes, this business is here. We know they're here. They're operating within all of our ordinances or statutes. Um, here you go. Typically, it's something that if you have it, you will know. Uh, it would have been part of opening the business and it's probably hanging on the wall. There are going to be times where we're going to ask. If nothing's provided, we're not going to assume one is not needed. We will ask, okay? If one's not needed, it's fine, but we need a signed statement from the provider that indicates that it's not. We've sometimes seen this from the, um, the city's uh, county and state government. That's not necessary, it can be from the provider, signed by the provider or authorized or delegated official, just indicating that the entity does not require a business license or permit in order to practice. We just need to know, okay? So one or the other is generally needed. This isn't needed for group members. Again, this is a business requirement. So if you're joining a medical clinic, that provider's not gonna need it. The medical clinic when they enroll, they might need it. But I can tell you for certain that's something that as the provider community, you would need to research for that business. All right, this next item is an example of an accreditation. And this ties in a little bit to the um, previous question about FQHCs as far as um, 
what kind of requirements they would need, it's possible an FQHC may have an accreditation. So an accreditation, it's usually, a lot of times we see them most often from the Joint Commission, which is what you see on the left. It's a lot like, say the physician assistant and the nurse practitioner, those certification programs, it's a lot like that. They're not required necessarily for enrollment, but if you have one, you do need to report it to us and let us know. Again, checking those resources that we gave you to see if it's required. Uh, what this can do is if there's an accreditation in place, it generally indicates to uh, the MACs and CMS that the facility has already been inspected. And particularly with Part A facilities, there are times where you need to have an inspection in order to enroll or a state inspection. Sometimes this can make that, that certification, that, that process of assigning that PTN go more smoothly and sometimes a little bit quicker. I can't guarantee exactly what that's, uh, what that timeline will be, but I can tell you this is basically telling the MAC and CMS that, hey, I think they may have already gone through the survey process. Take a look. Does it meet your needs? Depends on any surveys or um, activities that are part of getting that accreditation, but it can assist. So if you have one, I highly recommend reporting that on your applications. Again, this is going to be largely an 855A, a Part A provider organization type of, of, of document that you would provide. So if you don't have an accreditation, you're a medical group, that's fine. You won't report it, we won't ask for it. This next item is for organizational structure and I can tell you that the chat has been added, or excuse me, a link has been added to a resource for this. Um, this is an organizational structure chart. This is going to be something that's going to be needed by entities typically when they have section 5 of that 855B or that 855A completed. So we need to see that organizational structure to see where the ownership lines go to ensure that we have all ownership reported and accounted for on the application. This is a CMS requirement, um, chapter 10, section 10.6.7.1 outlines that requirement. And as you can see here from the examples, it can be super simple. There's one organization that owns the enrolling entity. It's two boxes and an arrow. It can be mostly maybe a little bit more involved, but mostly a straight line of ownership. Um, that is what you're seeing in that middle diagram. And we're looking for direct and indirect owners. Um, so that is something that is reviewed during, during the enrollment process. Um, the item that you see in number three, that is actually a valid organizational structure provided that those titles are leveraged in section five and six so that we can make the correlation between what's reported on the application and what's on the organizational structure diagram. This is something if it's not provided or there's questions on it, this is where you can see some of that case by case development for this. We need to make sure that we are accounting for for all entities, all individuals that either directly or indirectly have control over the provider and in turn some type of access or oversight over Medicare billing activities and the funds. Um, so with the flowcharts, we've talked about Chapter 10. We do have a resource available on our website as well. This time I'm just going to go back to the one underneath documentation. Same place we've gone to a couple of times, provider enrollment documentation, CP575. There is a resource for both Part A and Part B um, that talks about all of the information that needs to be um, reported on that flowchart, including examples, okay, of what they can look like. And this can, most organizations have one set up, but if you're looking for one and you're not sure if what you have meets the requirements, this can be helpful. We're looking for the name of the entity that's enrolling. We are looking for everybody listed basically in section two, which is the entity enrolling, section five, which are those entities that are have oversight or ownership in the enrolling organization. And I mentioned section six, and this typically happens with skilled nursing facilities. We're looking for a little bit deeper dive into that ownership. So I highly encourage you to take a look at this. This can be a very helpful resource for you. So change of ownership documentation. This can get a little bit 
um, interesting. And by that is people are just usually really kind of unsure of what to have. Now, a change of ownership is when one entity buys another and typically in the part A realm, they are accepting, they are going to basically assume the provider number, they're assuming the provider agreement, they're buying out another company. They could potentially lease out that other company. And that can happen. It does require an enrollment application. Typically the buyer is filling out an initial 855A and then there's a termination of the old PTAN's not changing, but we have to change over some of the information. So part of that is timing. And we need to make sure that we can confirm the terms of that sale. So the items that we typically need for a change of ownership are going to be a copy of that bill of sale signed by both entities. We need to know who the existing operator is, who the new operator is. They're all in agreement on the terms, what those terms are, um, so that we know where the existing enrollment lies. Who's assuming what? How do we move forward from this? Um, timing, again, timing. What's the effective date of that sale happening, and then a copy of that sales agreement. That is all going to tell us that same information, who the players are, what they're agreeing to, and timing. The next few documents we're gonna talk about are not so much just documentation, but there are additional forms that you may need to provide in addition to a CMS 855 application. Again, this is going to impact your 855Bs, your 855As, your 2134s for um, diabetes prevention programs. It can also impact individual providers, that 855i, if they're in some sort of private practice, either under social security number only or a tax ID as well. This first one is the CMS 460, and this is the participation agreement. This one's not going to impact Part A, but this is definitely a Part B. Being enrolled in Medicare is not the same as being a participating provider in Medicare. I always kind of compare it to the difference of being in or out of network. It's not the same. Medicare Part B doesn't have a network. You're either choosing to participate and accept Medicare payment as payment in full, or you're not participating. And that is, you know, at, at its simplest. So, but this is, that's something you can relate to. It's, Filling out that 460 is telling us you are going to accept Medicare payment as payment in full. It is optional. Um, you will need, if you fill this out, you will, your PTM will be set up to accept assignment on all claims. As I mentioned, it can impact the individuals, the orgs, and it's not something in Part A. There's no additional documentation required when filling out this form, and it is three pages. The first page is the page of the form. The other two pages are the instructions. They are what you're agreeing to. If you're filling this out or considering it, um, I do suggest that you read through this just so you have a full understanding. And it's something each business has to make a decision for on their own by looking at the fee schedules. Again, it doesn't impact, is it, doesn't impact Part A because they are reimbursed on a different payment system. So this is going to be a Part B documentation item only. The next item is going to be impact your payments, and this will impact everybody. Uh, group members will have to follow suit with their group, just like the 460. But again, individuals in private practice, 855As, 855Bs, those, those 2134s. Uh, this is for electronic deposits. This can impact a new enrollment or change. So if it's a new enrollment, we're setting up the bank account for the first time. So we need all of the banking information. If there's a change in bank, change in routing number, change in account number, change in legal business name because there's a change in tax ID, which is actually an initial enrollment, we need this form. Uh, for revalidations, I do want to point out, we only need this form if the account information is either not on file, which is highly unlikely, we're not paying anyone on paper, or it has changed, okay? Um, electronic payment is a requirement, so chances of it not being on file and you getting paid from Medicare are pretty much zero, but again, changes happen, okay? It is going to require some additional documentation. We have to verify the account information. So what we need to have, I'll show you some examples here. We need a copy of a voided check or a bank letter. 
that has the legal name of the owner of the account who's getting paid and it needs to be the provider that's enrolling. It can't include others. Uh, we see that a lot in private practice where it might be a joint account with a spouse. It has to be the provider enrolling. Um, we cannot accept starter checks. We're not looking for a particular check number. It doesn't have, you know, if it's 100, but it's a valid check, it's not a starter check. We'll take it. It doesn't have to be at a thousand or above, but it cannot be a starter check. It has to be printed, has to include all of the information, nothing handwritten. If it's a new account, we can take a bank letter. It has to be signed by a representative from the bank and has to include all of that same information. So the owner, you know, who, whose account is the name in. Um, another reason we get these is the type of account. Maybe the funds aren't going into a checking account. Maybe they're going into a savings account. Generally, you're going to need a bank letter. You might not have checks for that savings account. So we need that bank letter. And we're also looking for that letter to not be more than a year old. So you have a lot of leeway. It can be fairly old, but not more than a year. We just want to make sure everything that's on there hasn't changed, is still current, is still correct. So I'm going to do one quick check here for any questions before I talk about uploading. We're getting ready to wrap up here. But before I get into uploading documents in Pecos, Mary, are there any questions in the chat? And we received one more question. Okay. Can FQHCs use the HRSA award for accreditation? They can, and we do actually see those HRSAs come in. So that is something that can be, um, if you have a certificate from HRSA, certainly can submit that with your application. That is a viable option. All right. That's all the questions so far. Beautiful. Thank you. So uploading documents. Again, paper documents, you're going to include it with your application, stick it in an envelope, send it through the mail. Easy. Sometimes people struggle a little bit with uploading PECOS documents. And there's a couple of parameters that I'm going to give you that are going to help. Um, when you're filling out a PECOS electronic application, towards the end, it's going to ask you this question. This is what that screen is going to look like. Do you want to upload one or more documents? You have to generally, there's a, there's a size limit, so I generally recommend uploading um, smaller documents. You can combine them, that is okay. Uh, but you can upload multiple if you have too many documents or they're too large. That can happen with sales agreements because they're multiple pages. Um, you, you just tell the system yes. And towards the bottom of that page, it's going to ask you to select from some pre populated document types. If you don't see yours, other is an option. If you select the wrong one, it's not the end of the world. Our enrollment area does look at each document to confirm it is what it says it is. Um, and we know how to uh, store them in a way that it meets those qualifications and note that we did indeed receive X even if the document title isn't correct. So document title is not necessarily it might cause a little more research, but it's not necessarily going to cause something to not be accepted. We're looking at the document and its value of what it contains. Uh, the document file type, we can only accept portable document formats or PDFs. Everybody's usually pretty familiar with those. And tag image file formats or TIFFs. We cannot ex accept uh, JPEGs or PNGs, so like picture files. That is not something that that the system allows for. So if it does upload it, it probably won't. If you're getting errors, it could be your file format. If it does upload it, we are not going to be able to open anything that's not a PDF or a TIFF. So we may ask for it, even though you did get it attached. Sometimes those are some of the things that happen there. And then the other thing is it has to be less than 10 megabytes. Anything bigger than that, the system's probably going to give you an error. And it's really just about breaking up that document so it's less than 10. That's just a storage limitation that the current PECO system has. Um, I don't know if that's going to improve with the new system. We're hoping it does, uh, so stay tuned on that. But at this time, 10 megs is as large as those files can be. So before I check for questions one more time, I do want to leave you with links for resources. Uh, the WPSGHA website, those are the three resources that I showed you today on documentation, CP575 and flowcharts. There's a link here to chapter 10 as well as our YouTube channel. There's a lot of good information out there. 
Um, with that, I do want to check one more time, Mary. Do we have any questions in the chat? No new questions. Excellent. Thank you. And finally, that ends our presentation for today. We went a little over, so I thank you all for your time. On behalf of myself and everyone on the WPS GHA Provider Enrollment Outreach and Education Team, I'd like to thank you all for taking time to attend today. We do look forward to those survey comments. Again, please be sure to include any future topics you'd like to see. And again, thank you. I hope you all are well, and you may now disconnect.